Elizabeth Bell. Uh, we have our special guest, who I am equally uh, as uh, pleased and honored to welcome on stage. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Elizabeth Churchill. She's also one of the shining lights at HCI and user research, uh, and she's a current director uh, at Google of user research. She uh, played defining, shaping roles, places like Park, FXPAL. Uh, again, bio too long to mention. She is currently the executive vice president of the Association of Computing Machinery. That alone is a round of applause, I believe. And truly, I guess one word that comes to mind for me when I describe Elizabeth is badass, if I may say so. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. So. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. First, I have to. Oh, can you roll that? <laughs> Got to get my glasses. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful, wonderful talk. So, my first question to you is: Now you've got us all galvanized. We're all excited to go and sort of think differently. What are three things that each of us can do in our somewhat resistant workplaces in order to start to move things forward? Okay, here we go. Yep. The, um, you have to understand that I've known Elizabeth for a really long time, although we haven't seen each other for a long time. And she always does this to me. <laughs> so um, I think what's really critical is to understand that despite appearances, uh, technological, technology is not progressing quickly. It's moving very, very slowly. And we confuse a bunch of things moving slowly with uh, something moving fast. And therefore, it's what I call the long nose, but this is uh, a, an old, uh, it's not a new concept, I just call it the long nose because I took Chris Anderson's long tail and flipped it around and made a, a theorem out of it. But, the, but at least it takes 20 years for anything to mature from when it's first done. So we have time to plan and figure these things out. So the first thing I do is learn how to prospect. Um, the future's already here, you just have to know where to look. That's William Gibson, but it's absolutely true. And, and so we're so obsessed with inventing and creating that we stop prospecting and looking and digging. Uh, I believe that eBay is actually a more useful tool than all the 3D printers in the world put together because anything, on, everything that's ever been done is on eBay for $100. And, uh, and so for 100 bucks, I can get a prototype which would cost me a quarter of a million to build and it's already a product, and I can just get a bunch of them and give them around so everybody knows. So go learn how to find things which on the surface are not what you're thinking about, but actually manifest the properties, meaningful properties that you want to convey. So you don't lecture, you just give them to people and let them uh, experience them. That's, that's one thing. Learn to prospect and pay attention to history. The second thing is, is that um, understand that Jimi Hendrix asked the most important question about our field, and that is, are you experienced? Um, and and how, if you're an experience designer, um, if your range of experience that you're bringing to a problem is narrow, well, why do you expect to do a good job at it? And so individually, because we're limited, uh, we can't do everything, we need to expand the team. So what is the diversity of the team and the opinions that are coming into the conversation? And the third, I say, would be to learn how to coach your cohorts into a designerly way of, of conversation of what we do when we have crit. That is to say that the social mores, the social structure should be, you are allowed to give the positive and negatives to every single idea, but you're not allowed to opine for the adoption or rejection of any solution that's on the board until you're equally literate about the full 360 from the black to the white, the positive to the negative. You must make informed decisions and not, our biggest mistake is we start to build way before we have the proper information because we're behind schedule. And if I was gonna add a fourth one, if I'm allowed to add, it would be you have to speak to your management and, and make the point that how is it that we can afford for products to be late at the highest burn rate, but never have time to design at the front at the lowest burn rate? A month spent at the front can save a year at the end. And, and, and then you have to be able to put your money where your mouth is and say, give me a chance to manage a project my way, a small one, to prove it, and then bring that to the next. And I'll practice what I preach. Sketchbook Pro 
that Autodesk, it's now Autodesk Sketchbook Pro, but it was Alias. I had no team, and it was exactly to do that, how that product exists. To, I wanted to prove that with a different process, we could bring a product from July 1st, we had no product, no idea, no connections, and it shipped on October the 3rd. So, sorry, in November, November 2nd, uh, 2002, the same year. And, and, it, and, and the point was that you had to prove the process, but with low stakes. And, and so those are the types of things. You have to work the whole team and realize that it doesn't, it's not everybody's, you have to understand the full ecosystem that's involved in the product. That's a way too long of an answer, but it was a hard question. No, it's great. It's a great answer. Um, because the next thing I was going to say was, like, so if that's internal, how could we as a collective community start to tell the stories that could actually shift the business logics? Because I think this prolifer pr proliferation of seams and devices often comes because there's a particular business logic that is driving that to happen. So how can we start to tell stories to give our you know, leaders and the folks who are running the businesses the right data that they need to start changing those processes in the ways that you're saying? So I think the, first of all, using the exact language I'd use, uh, uh, let's be very clear, stories are the original form of viral marketing. And, and therefore, it's important that we're very good at, and understand everybody in research and design is a marketeer. It's just the products we're selling and marketing are, um, are different than the people who are paying our salaries in terms of what goes out to, to end customers. We just have different customers. And so we have to be effective with stories. But the one thing to let for a story to go viral is you must not own it. You may have made it up. You may have written it. But you cannot ever come back and say, hey, that was my idea. No. You give it up the minute, or otherwise, and you make it so, and you have to frame your stories so other people can use them, tailor them, and make them their own without losing the message. You have to distinguish between the, the, the situations, but here's the plot and here's the moral of the story, um, but everything else, they can change all the characters and actions to make it their own and tailor that through your biety to exactly the audience they're speaking to and so that they can tailor it. I'd also really argue that we need to speak to different people within the organization and with those stories to find out ways to get them to get the point without lecturing them. Let them learn by doing. I'll give you an example. I, when touch screens came out and so on and so forth, I used to wear three or four watches. And therefore, I could do an elevator pitch to show why anybody who talks about something as a touch screen interface is unqualified to comment on the topic. <laughs> and that's a different lecture, but I, but I can do that. <laughs> that's my story. But they experienced it. They could try it and they could do it right there in the elevator from, uh, from the bottom floor to the seventh floor. You could finish the pitch because of eBay. And, and, uh, and so I'm not dissing prototype and, and 3D printers. I'm just saying that uh, sampling is 3D printing synthesis of ideas for prototypes. Sampling is just another way. Anybody knows music knows those, how those two terms are used. What works in music works for here. Use them both, have them in your repertoire. But um, it, it takes a long time. Do not be impatient. Uh, what, it's happened at Microsoft since I joined where we, we started to try and change the culture to a design culture I thought would take three or four years that shows I'm an idiot and so don't trust me it, it's taken 12 but guess what you get there you've got to be persistent and you can't be impatient um, it's cultures change slowly and but you have to and if you go too fast you're going to just be disruptive in a way that's not helpful for anybody um, so one of the other things you brought up was that we kind of create the futures and we create particular futures. Now, you and I, as you say, go back away. So in addition to potentially changing the word ubiquitous, is there another big example where you would go back and you'd say, you know what, I wish we had done that particular thing differently because it's a really big example. I think I would have... Um I think that things like think we knew that big displays were coming, and the integration of big displays with uh, pen and touch and voice is something we could have and should have uh, pursued much more aggressively, much sooner. So that when people like Jeff brought these things to market, um, uh, we weren't ready. Mm. And uh, and I can make all kinds of excuses, but I. They're not worthy excuses. <laughs> and, 
and uh, that's, a, that's a regret. And I would say the same thing um, about we think about uh, things like collaboration, uh, voice, because it's another you and I have worked together in, and what I guess you could say with FaceTime and Skype and so on, uh, back in the early days uh, from the media space work, um, we, we kept the person space separate from the task space, and we didn't get good enough integration there. And I, I think I can't quite ever spill milk, but I can look and sorry, try and figure out why we missed that. And there's, there's good reasons, because we were just fighting to be taken seriously even for these little things. But I think those reasons don't, uh, there's different reasons that are going to inhibit different things, but hopefully those battles have been fought and we won't make that list again. But our great creativity is the ability to make uh, 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 new ways to fail. Uh, but but, but I, I just say one thing quickly about this is because we talked about this word creativity. And this ties into storytelling. Uh, this is sort of something that occurred to me. It's one of these obvious things, but you'll understand why it's OK to be obvious. My definition, operational definition of the word creativity is creativity is the act of making the obvious obvious before it's obvious. <laughs> and, and, and that's what your stories are supposed to do. As soon as you say, oh, that's of course. And by the way, you realize that as soon as your audience says, well, it's obvious, they're not going to pat you on the back for being brilliant. But that's not what you did it for, I hope. You did it so that they, they're going to now say it's obvious, and then they're going to it's going to go viral, right? And that's, that's part of it. That's, that's maybe the, one of the litmus tests of a good story. Yeah. Uh, so one of the other things you talked about a lot was um, the seamlessness. You have this beautiful seamless journey. When is it right to be seamful? How do we get, how do we, how do we stop being thoughtlessly seamful and start to be thoughtfully seamful? How do we start to really understand when the seams really should be there? So the, the, the <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> um, the, the, the thing is, first of all, when somebody says easy, things have to be easy to use, call them on it. And just, but don't do it in a nasty way. Just say, yeah, that's great. Actually, I, I know a great example how we can use that. I'm going to make a video game that you push a button, you've won. <laughs> right? Because good video game design is understanding where to put the complexity and matching that to human behavior and expectations. So now we've got that. See, there's a story. Now we've got that off the table. Now we can talk about where do we put the complexity. And, 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 but also, where do we remove it? And I would say that it comes down to this notion, comes back to mobility of human behavior. Let's be very clear, and I'll give you an example. That what we do, if we believe that our technologies behave, affect behavior, and they do, then the greatest way we can control behavior is by using the bias of the path of least resistance. For the things we want people to do, there's always qualifications, but for sake of the high first order bit, is we make sure that that's the, the preferred path is the one that's the, the, the most discoverable and easiest to use. And, and we'll engineer for that. And if you go back to Apple, one of the things that was really interesting is they did that beautifully with the first version of the Macintosh. Yes, there were the Apple user interface guidelines. No, nobody ever read them. They built Mac App, which made it easiest to do it in the standard way. And when in doubt, look at Mac Write, Mac Paint, and Mac Draw, all of which were useless, as was the first Macintosh. Um, but they showed the interaction language as opposed to great applications. And so you got consistency. Now, consistency in that narrow context of consistency, but appropriate for the time in history. And so they had that holistic view about what was the vision, and every single thing was directed in that path. And so I, I'd say that um, where to put the walls and that are, are clear. What I do want to say is that from work we did is that when we're in the early days of video conferencing and stuff like that and these notions about reciprocity and the stuff that Bill Gaver would go on about and Lucy Sachman would beat me up with a baseball bat and stuff like that was 
was a sociologist friend of mine, Gail Moore, at, on the Telepresence Project in Toronto. She came and said, Bill, what you don't understand is this. First, um, if you put the firewalls in and you, uh, too early, you're going to probably put them where the fire exits should be and vice versa. And she said, when you're talking about privacy and these other things, the first thing you should have to do before you start even assuming that it's a technological problem, step back and say, no, there's actually three strategies. There's legal, there's social uh, uh, behaviors and, and like the moral order, and, and there's technological. But why would you assume, just because you're an engineer, that that that, uh, that that, and I was proud she called me an engineer because I'm not, but, but, but the point is, is that those are the types of questions, that's why you need a sociologist and, and, and people like that to actually keep you honest, and then you know where to build the barriers and when. It's more a question not so much where, but when and why. And if you can't give a design rationale, it comes out of Euro Park stuff as well, but the stuff about design rationale, if you cannot rationalize every decision, but if you do say why, these are, these are my beliefs, whenever we, my team would do that, we put the beliefs we believe and underlying principles on the wall. On, and the next, when we do a decision, we put the reason. Mm -hmm. Now people say, well, will you, now we can't change that decision back there because we'll never get there. Well, no, you can. If the conditions according to the rationale have changed, then you probably should change it. That's the old thing, right? The, the best way to a mediocre, pro, uh, a mediocre uh, result is to follow, make a plan and, fo and, and follow it, stick to it. And, and the, but the question is you can't be random. But if you can rationalize it and make the economic argument, I'd rather ship a little bit later and, than have a product that has a, a real failure. Um, Boeing has found that out. And when we were talking earlier, you had a really nice point, which was when we first started doing some of that work, the sort of presence work, um, the things that we were measuring were not the things that actually were really leading to the success and the feeling of co-presence. Do you want to articulate a little bit more of that? Because I think the audience would love to hear it. <laughs> so first of all, this is a, a, a response to this data-driven uh, mania we're living in right now. Data is great, but if uh, but there's some things that are really hard to measure and that are really important. And so it's easy to get blown away by, by data when there's other intangibles that, uh, that. And so you have to find what is the answer. How can you fight data with stuff that's not data? And 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 that's where we really need to be good. I, I have no blanket answer for that. I just want to raise the problem. But the thing was is that in the early days of, of desktop video conferencing, is that um, all the stuff about all the studies um, from the social science that are doing all these user studies said that, that, that video conferencing is just a really expensive and it doesn't add anything to the conversation. There's the communication, the work getting done and so on is no better and so on and so forth. And then probably the data is still the same that way. But the problem was we realized that it wasn't about communication, it was about trustification. And so I had to invent a new word. I, I don't know if I invented it, but I, I, I started to use a, a word that I'd never heard before um, because to try and make that point, and, and I chose a word that actually sounded a bit like communication to, to understand that they're parallels and they both go on. But if you measure trust instead of what, uh, what work was done, that's a very different thing. And, and I, I can sure get a better sense of the confidence interval, whether you think I'm talking nonsense or whether it's a joke or whatever, and, and what are the things that affect trust? That's the thing to study but it's hard to study. And therefore, it's easier to measure these things, so let's do that, because we can get a Kai paper, right? <laughs> um, I'm gonna change tack a little bit, because you are sort of a historian. You have collected all of these artifacts in the Buxton collection. Um, I wonder if you could tell folks a little bit about the Buxton collection, but also, what's missing from your collection that you'd like to have that maybe is in this world of emerging AI? So, my name is Bill, and I'm not a hoarder, I'm a collector. <laughs> Um, I do have a uh, thousand artifacts uh, representing the history of interactive devices from about 1971, I think is where my first mouse comes from. And uh, up till today, um, they largely live in my house. I also have the most patient wife in the world. Um, and, the, and I am curating them, I am gonna donate them to a museum and make them available. But, uh, and, and they're there to document because I, and I'm not gonna give them to a technological museum because I believe the things that we create are actually cultural artifacts. They represent things that have more impact on our culture over the last 50 years than music, cinema, art, dance, architecture combined. And, and, and so it's very clear that I want them to be seen that way and understand what are the cultural influences in both directions in their existence. Um, and I, if you invite me back sometime, I'll come and give a talk just on that. 
and you will love um, the, um, the, the 1950 um, uh, um, Zenith remote control, the Flashmatic, and uh, I'll tell you about Flash Gordon. So the, the, the thing is that it's really important that these things that are just prototypes that we um, throw away, if, uh, you were in Fitbit, boy, if anybody, the, whoever the gentleman was who's the head of design, if you've got, can trace the history of some of your products with the prototypes, um, I would love that sort of stuff. I, the process of the artifacts is as, if not more important than the artifacts themselves. And then amongst the artifacts, I want to do the history. I want to teach the difference. I want to get rid of this myth. Um, Marx, among others, uh, made this argument, but so it goes back. I don't believe in hero inventors. I believe that people who help bring things over the tipping point, they just happen to be there at the right time, but it always is about the evolution and people standing on the shoulders of giants. The most you can hope for is to, first, your first task is find whose shoulders to stand on, and second of all, work as hard as you can so your shoulders are worthy for somebody else to stand on. That's all you can ask out of your career. And if you can do that, well, God bless you, you're gonna die a happy person. And, and the point is that, how do you illustrate that so that People don't grow up trying to be Johnny Ive, thinking that Johnny Ive invented everything from scratch. But if you can show that, that what he got um, from Braun, um, Braun got from, uh, I, I can trace these things back generations. And what staggers me is that we think we're creatives. We're working in a creative discipline doing design. And there's no other discipline, design discipline that I'm aware of, where there's no sense of shame for not understanding our history. Um, to graduate with a music degree, an undergraduate degree, I had to be able to pull, when you pull out a record out of the library, they had to play 15 seconds of it, and I had to date it within 50 years from the whole history of, of Western music. Um, architect students can tell you every building who designed it in this city. Um, the, the arts, artists know the art history, they walk into any museum and tell you that. We don't know our own history. And therefore, we don't know how to use eBay to sample the world, right? And, and so let's be very clear. As soon as my collection is online and in the museum, I'm going to be like a hound dog of people who, don't, who build stuff without paying attention to what's already happened. And so instead of starting up there because they know what's been done, they start down here and waste their company's money and my time and, uh, and everybody else's time. The world deserves better. Now, what's missing? First, I love examples from the history coming. Uh, if you know about, if you want, email me, I'll show you what I have. If you know who the designers were of the specific mice or any of the devices, please tell me. I would love a transparent script held tablet because I, I can't find one and it was instrumental to the, the active desk we built that, and so on. And um, I'd love a micro uh, scribe the, and, and so on and so forth. I can't find one of those. They're, they're, they cost a fortune. But, the, um, but, the, but if you have something, do you think, hey, this was really important to my life? Tell me, but here's the better part. I wanna humanize it. I'll, I've got the entire list of what I have, pictures. If any of those devices meant something to you or somebody you know, write me a paragraph or a page about why. Whether it was a terrible experience or a great experience, because otherwise it's just a catalog of technological features or stuff I make up. But the best thing you can give me are your stories about anything in that collection, and they will become part of the archive. And I promise they'll be there. I'll, I'll give credit and stuff like that. And, but I will curate it, and, and, and those are the parts that will help the storytelling. And the real ambition right now is to have the People magazine version of the collection. That is just the, the personality profiles of all the devices. And the second one is all, like the, what's it called, the, in, uh, the IMDB, the, the, the movie thing? write the scripts of all these narratives that cross of which these different devices were protagonists so that you can actually traverse it by the, um, by the theme where some of the protagonists are in many of these narratives and others aren't. But it, they have to be in some of that because those are the things that actually teach the lessons. It's the narratives that are constructed on top of them. And so if you can contribute to that, that's even more important than another device that I have to photograph and die. That's, so anyhow, I should stop there. That's fantastic. We have one minute left. Okay. And I want to ask you just, I want to first say thanks to the Redux organizers. Now you were at the conference in Seattle and now you're back at the Redux. I know that you relish being surprised by something. What did you experience in Seattle that you walked away going, whoa, that really surprised me and I'm thinking differently now? Oh, that's easy. So listen, this is, this is the, 
I live in a couple worlds, and that's the best, uh, that's what I love about my life, is that uh, there's, this, there's this sort of uh, cultural fluidity or something. But there's this academic world of Sekai and so on and so forth, and it's all academic and stuff like that. I think I might have given a keynote at the first uh, IXDA conference that was, that was at, at um, in, um, oh, the Savannah College, yeah. I th was that the first one? Yeah, so, so first of all, I was delighted by how I loved that conference, but I, I loved the transition, how much the organization's grown. That was, it just, it, second, it felt just like home. It felt like fresh air. But the other part was, you're practitioners as opposed to academics, and you're, you're, you, you're, you're, uh, you're right on the line all the time, right at, at the front end of the line. And, and I think that what blew me away was that the conference was curated according to a theme and so on, and more importantly, that, that the bulk of the conversation was around ethics and morality and, and the whole side of uh, the social impact. You're supposed to be the pragmatics out there, just I just want the product done and you know, sort of stuff. No, no, you were doing that more than anybody at Kai does in some organized way, and it was systematic. It wasn't like a paper here and a paper there. It was in, the whole thing was programmed for that, and it's exactly what happened today. And, uh, and actually, that's why I absolutely, I, I literally flew down yesterday morning. I'm here today, I have to fly out tomorrow morning, I have to be in Europe you know, in two days. I, I did that because of how much that uh, I was impressed by the experience of, of, of the conference in Seattle. And I really thank you for inviting me back so I can get a double dose. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Could you, could you stay seated for a second? And we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience, if there are any. Yeah. We're going to have our fun catch box back again and uh, walking mics as well. Is there anybody who has a question for Bill? Here we go. Um, hi. Uh, great talk again. Uh, so I, wondered, I was wondering if uh, privacy as a human concept, uh, is it uh, something that's limited only to uh, the current generation, and it will fade away with future generations. So the question is, is privacy going to, is it still relevant, especially to the current generation? See, I, I turned 70 a couple weeks ago, and so I can, time has a different meaning to uh, millennials to, than to me. I would argue that ask that generation in 10 years if it has meaning. And I think they're going to be surprised that, um, um, and so it's uh, our perceptions of these things are going to change, and we are going to have some things we're really glad about. And we're going to have some things that we are going to really regret having um, released. I think if I did the math, uh, your personal information, everything on Facebook of yours when it went public was uh, your day that you were the product, not the customer, and it was sold for two hundred and twelve dollars in perpetuity. Uh, I believe that's the, my rough calculation, but I'm 70, so I can't remember the numbers well, but it's about that. And so these are interesting things, and that's why I thought one of the conversations earlier today was really interesting about this notion about payment, who owns it, who benefits uh, from, from our personal information and that management. I think it's an important issue. Um, I think the question is, are we aware, we, we do not have a strong sense <laughs> of the notion that what I grew up with is there is no free lunch, nothing is free, and any time you get something for free, you're not, it's not free. You just are not aware of the currency within, with which you're paying. And once you understand the currency, do you understand the exchange rate, two dollars and cents, in terms of other uh, costs and benefits. And so it's really important because a lot of what the manipulation that's been happening in the press has been because things are free. And I'd rather pay. I pay for newspapers. I pay for. Uh, I always pay for music. I I pay for music from the musicians so that they get the full thing rather than going through. Because I I used to be a musician. I used to make my. I, I lived off royalties, um, and so I, I just. It's a, it's a question we can articulate some of those things in how we behave. But I think it's. I'm not going to pretend I have the answers. I but I can't say it's we're probably not giving enough thought to it. And I would argue that we who have insights into the community and what's going on right now 
I think we have a responsibility to go out and speak publicly. Uh, what I've said to the SIGCHI community is write fewer articles per year and write essays in the, to the general press and give talks in general press because sometimes journalists are doing their best, but they're having their legs chopped off at the knees as well. So if, if who's going to speak for that? And there are a few journalists that are outstanding, but um, we need to be, we have a role. If we believe in the user and the user experience and the quality of life, then we have a role to that outreach to try and help that and not just speak to ourselves. This is great, but now go forth and multiply type of thing. And, uh, and, and I think that those, that kind of outreach is really critical. Inform. You don't have to preach. Just help inform and be as unbalanced and try to make sure you give balanced conversations. Otherwise, you're going to be a, a raving lunatic or written off that way. Uh, it doesn't have to be polarized. One more question. Sorry. Uh, they, they didn't throw it at me. I was kind of hoping they would so I could show <laughs> off my hands. Uh, they're like pillows. Um, so thank you very much. I'm honored that I actually get to ask a question. Um, earlier, just a little bit ago, you mentioned you were talking about how, you know, you want to craft the story and then set it free to let it go viral. Um, I guess I'm wondering, how do you view, like, the dichotomy of being, like, kind of selfless in that sense of, like, I want to shape things and send things forward and the goodness is the goodness versus trying to help... Uh, have an organization value the design group that's actually shaping those stories? And where do those two things intersect? Like, if I'm like, hey, these are our customers, we gotta care about them and do these things, people go like, yeah, and like they carry that story forward and then they, and then the design organization or whatever is still just kind of like toiling away and like they can keep creating more great viral stories, but if, like, how does that ownership work in your mind, and how do you kind of try to make sure you are, to your point of like buying music from the musicians, the artist is still credited even if the story's gone viral? So that, that, that's obviously a, a tricky question, and hard to give you a, a quick answers, a couple of quick uh, responses that might be helpful. The first thing is, um, one of my, I can't remember who it was, but said to me, because I was, you know, I whined about, hey, I didn't get credit for something. And they said, don't worry about it. Just let it go and get on with things. Um, because, you know, if you keep going, uh, you're going to get credit for things you didn't do. And it's going to come out in the wash. And so that's, that's, a, that's a sort of a backwards way to explain it. But there's a certain element of truth in that. But I would say a much stronger thing is, is that there's a few people who I really, really respected that I think were brilliant and did some unbelievably uh, great work. And then they did nothing after because they spent their entire time in a rear guard action protecting that they were the ones who had those ideas and damn it, and anybody else is taking credit for that. And they never did another thing. And I felt cheated, I checked, gypped, and I felt, oh, how, and, I, and I was determined I would never do that. And I've tried not to. And I, I, you can see Elizabeth shaking. We, we all have those stories. And so, and, and look at it this way. Uh, it hasn't hurt me, right? You can write, you can help teach, and that's it. What's better than to teach and see stuff happening and watch things flourish? And if you can have that kind of influence, that's far more leadership than having power. It's the power to persuade, not the power to control. And I think that um, the, my philosophy since I was 12 years old was that, uh, you know, um, Everybody's searching for recognition, but the, the difference between a wise person and a fool is your choice of audience. Whose respect do you want? It's not this mass. It's, there's people I respect. That's, that's, the question is, is who do you respect? And that's whose respect I want, reciprocate. I want to be worthy of the people I respect. And, and then and, and let the rest go. Uh, you, can, you can want to become the Kardashians, that's fine. And that's probably it. But, but, but no, that's not what, that's, that, I'm not criticizing them. They have their lives. That's their decisions, and it's theirs to make. But it's not the decision for me, and I suspect it's not the decision for you. It's a different, we chose different paths, and, that's, and diversity is wonderful. And, and so the question is, which, which, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm still trying to find out, but it's, a, we'll find out. But, but that's the best I can say about that. It's a, um, it's, it, listen, it takes 20 years for an idea to be from the time it's there to the time it, it's, it's gotten traction to become a billion dollar industry. That's what the data says. The mouse took 30. Patents only last 20 years. 
Engelbert didn't get a penny because the patent expired by the time, by the time Windows 95 came out. He did 65 to 95, so it's 30 years. So it doesn't matter. I refused to patent any of the work I did in universities. It was just a matter of principle because uh, the money I'd paid a patent that I could hire a graduate student and do way more work. Why would I, who cares? If I wanted to go in business, I would have done a startup. It's a different story there. So you just have to know where you are and what you want and what's the best way to get it. And don't follow the path just because everybody else is doing it. You have to trust your own values and then act accordingly and take your hits. But those hits may hurt, but they're really just an expensive education for which you've paid the full tuition. So now what did you learn from it? I think one more, right? Here you go. OK, uh, so this is in the context of your um, comment about Johnny Eve's work being based on Dieter Rams and Hans Guzelow going back to Walter Teague and, and all that. Um, and how this compared to other fields, other creative fields, uh, in our profession, we don't have that strong sense of history as well learning from that history. So question is basically how do we bring that? in our education um, as well in our profession, uh, whether that is through master apprenticeship model or any other suggestions or ideas you have. So that's all, thank you. So the, and, and just to really emphasize this, um, I respect Johnny Ive all the more for who he chose and that tradition because he did his craft, he had the craft, and he actually raised the bar. On, so from him, from Dieter Rams to him, and Dieter Rams down to a painter Teague in Petersville, who did the Regency uh, radio that, uh, the, that, the, that was the first step towards uh, what became the iPod Classic. And, 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 and going back to Teague, which is the iPod uh, minis that were multiple colors went back to some uh, Kodak, the best, uh, they call the vanity cameras from 1929 from uh, uh, Walter Doran Teague, who was first project for, maybe it wasn't his first for, for Kodak. The point is, I'm saying is that I actually respect, same way when, when, when Keith Richards is playing a, a, a lick from Muddy Waters, you know, he expects you to know that that's who he's quoting. And the, and the musical delight is the listener is that, hey, he's playing that, why is he playing that? Like, why is he putting it there? Where's he gonna go with it, right? Those, that's the magic, and so, if as designers, the more you start to learn and look and, and find, that way all of a sudden design, great design isn't transparent. And that's the essence of why you become a better prospector. So you start looking about for these delightful things. The first time I walked out of the car and I sort of thought, holy cow, I never even, it was, I never even recognized how much it changed when, I, when the phone just, I'm just, I started laughing. Hey, I'm talking to Blair on my phone. My wife, what are you talking about? You, you've been talking about the car. Too. Yeah, but I'm not in the car anymore. It's just like, what is it? Or I'm hanging up clothes in a clothesline in my cabin, and I just started to laugh. And, and my, my wife says, well, what are you laughing at, you idiot? And I, because I'm, I'm, I'm hanging up my clothes. And she says, no, no, but look at I've got five clothes pegs in this hand here, and I'm putting this other one up here and holding the clothes and all at the same time. And isn't that amazing what the hand can do? <laughs> and, 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 by, and by contrast, how little we do with it. And, and it's that kind of delight when, you, when you're just always looking around and, and you're pulling these things out. And the more you know the history, the more you find these delightful things that are embedded in there. And then recognize that by that lateral thing and pulling these things from here and there and, and curating them into a different way and transforming them, that if you do it really well, you're gonna create that delight in other people. And they're gonna say, where the hell did that come from? And they're gonna buy you drinks and they're gonna say, well, well how did that happen? But the, and the easier, the more you have a diverse team and the different perspectives, the easier that is because they all see through different eyes. We're right back to Proust on the first slide. And that's a classic ABA structure that reflects Sonata Allegro form for my music career. Thank you very much. I, I could listen to this conversation for the rest of the weekend, but all good things come to an end, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Bill, for coming and doing this wonderful conversation.